Welcome back to Code Pink Radio. I'm your host, Marcy Winograd, and with me is Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink, to talk about an article that we wrote together entitled, Stop Biden from Sending Cluster Bombs to Ukraine. And you can read all about it at the codepink.org blog. Uh, in this article, we discuss efforts in Congress to block the shipment of these internationally banned weapons. Cluster munitions are shells that contain hundreds, if not thousands, of submunitions, small bombs that can be dropped by aircraft or fired by a ground-based weapon system to indiscriminately cover an area as wide as several football fields. The Pentagon likes these weapons. Why? Because they can strike multiple targets. They think somehow this is going to miraculously uh, help Ukraine in its counteroffensive that's been slow going. Human rights groups, prominent Democrats are coming out to denounce this decision. For a week, uh, up until Biden made the announcement official, there were lots of whispers, there were leaked reports that he might do this. He was, we weren't sure. Uh, but ultimately, he did approve setting these bombs that have been ba banned by over 100 countries. I was actually, you know, maybe I was naive, but yeah, I, don't know, I was surprised that he actually went ahead with this announcement. I'm wondering uh, what your reaction was. I wasn't surprised at all, Marcy, because he's been going back on everything that he says. You know, he gets so much pressure from the hawks in his own party, from the uh, Republican hawks from Zelensky himself, who says, you know, we're not making the progress we wanted to in this counteroffensive because you're not sending us enough weapons quickly enough. So, you know, he gets um, all that kind of pressure. And let's face it, he has been backtracking on every other uh, kind of weapons that he has said no to. So I wasn't surprised about it. Um, I am surprised. I mean, it is nice that there has been a reaction from some of the Democrats who have been going along with him on everything else. But, you know, it's a little bit um, too little too late. I don't know how you feel about it. Maybe, Marcy, you could talk about what the reaction among Democrats has been. Sure. Well, I, I like to be optimistic. A little too late. Well, it's a little at least, and we've got to build on that. And that's and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I was you know, heartened to see that there were voices on the Sunday talk shows. Tim Kaine, who is Hillary Clinton's vice presidential candidate from Virginia, he was on Fox News uh, denouncing Biden's decision. Uh, Barbara Lee, she went on CNN to say, look, uh, this is Barbara Lee talking as chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations. I, Barbara Lee, was instrumental in making sure that uh, these cluster munitions were banned. But there is, uh, of course, a loophole that allows for the president to say, this is a vital national security interest. We've got to send these weapons. But getting back to the Democrats, you know, the 19 Democrats uh, signed a letter talking about how this decision by Biden to send cluster munitions that have been banned by so many countries, including 18 NATO countries, uh, is... Uh, undermining U.S. moral leadership in the world. Well, I'm not sure that the U.S. has any moral leadership to begin with, but I guess that's the, the safe line for Democrats who oppose this decision. And then, you know, I, yesterday I, I looked at the Washington Post and there was an op-ed by uh, Tim Kaine again. Is this guy running for president? I'm wondering. Uh, Tim Kaine and former Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont. Oh, no, uh, I, I think that was Leahy and Merkley. Oh, you're right. Excuse yeah. me. Leahy and Merkley, uh, Merkley of Oregon. Uh, Leahy uh, was instrumental in, in pushing through a ban on landmines, yeah? So uh, it's getting some attention and it's also raising questions about NATO unity during the, the summit in Vilnius, Lithuania. It's, uh, I also um, think it's important to point out that the New York Times had its own editorial today uh, denouncing the decision. And it goes back to quote the Secretary General of the UN at the time, Ban Ki-moon, uh, who said that the ban expressed the world's collective revulsion at these abhorrent weapons. Uh, so I think it is good that there's been this backlash and that there are a few countries uh, within the NATO membership that have spoken out. Um, I also know that there is an amendment 
that has been introduced by Sarah Jacobs and Ilhan Omar to the National Defense Appropriations Act. And we will know this week whether that gets uh, axed or whether it stays in, but um, that is an important amendment to try to get more members of Congress to try to reverse Biden's decision. Yeah, so uh, the National Defense Authorization Act is the military budget, basically. It's called the NDAA. And uh, now we're looking at a $920 billion NDAA military budget. Uh, this amendment, there, you know, tons of amendments are introduced. We know we've seen them introduced and then they're discarded. Uh, some of them actually do hit the floor for a vote. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us at Code Pink, at listeners, anyone who supports peace, and abhors the use of these anti-personnel personnel weapons to ask their House representative to co-sponsor this bill. Uh, I, I understand that there are multiple organizations and human rights organizations that are making this request. So we'll see what happens. I know that Jim McGovern, who chairs the House Rules Committee, he was one of the first Democrats to co-sponsor this amendment. So uh, you know, any dissension on this, I think, is welcome, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's remember the House is now in the hands of the Republicans. So, um, you know, they're uh, unfortunately uh, not joining in uh, in this opposition. In fact, I haven't heard anything from that group of far right Republicans that have been opposing the weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I haven't heard them speak out about this. But I think, Marcy, all of this is important to put in the perspective that um, we don't want to just stop this horrific uh, weapon from being sent to Ukraine. We want to stop the war. And that uh, this is another example of how dangerous the escalation is. And that uh, we also know that uh, while these weapons might continue to kill civilians for many years to come, they're not going to change the uh, configuration on the battlefield. Uh, and so we really need to keep pushing for a ceasefire and peace talks. Yes, and just to back up a little, when you mentioned this uh, far right group in the Republican Party, I think they're the Freedom Caucus, or they're the, the, you know they were the outgrowth of the Freedom Caucus. Actually, I saw a tweet by Marjorie Taylor Greene. Hey, she's not my friend, okay? But she was. Uh, she could have been a member of Code Pink denouncing this in her tweet, saying this has nothing to do with national security, this is uh, abusive, uh, it's further escalation and so forth. So perhaps more and more will speak out within the Republican Party, though we know that the Republican leadership uh, in the Senate and in the House have been in support of sending these weapons. Let's talk about cluster cluster munitions for a minute. You know, the, the, the background and why there's so much outrage so just to, to run down the background and the, the timeline, this is what it looks like. In 2008, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates issued an order to phase out by 2018 cluster munitions with an unexploded ordnance rate of greater than 1%. Okay, in 2011, Obama affirms this policy. 2017, Trump disregards that policy. Uh, for 2018, he says uh, there will be no uh, deadline for phasing out cluster munitions that fail to explode. Uh, Congress then passed legislation forbidding the export of cluster bombs that leave behind more than 1% of their submunitions, or what they call duds. So they talk about a dud rate. Uh, however, as we see here, Biden's saying, hey, we've got to send these uh, abhorrent weapons to Ukraine because uh, this will help the counteroffensive. And he uses, he invokes this excuse of national, vital national security. What's your reaction, Medea? Is this uh, a vital national security? Well, it's ridiculous to say that sending cluster munitions is uh, in the national security because if the U.S. did care about uh, international law and being part of the uh, having some moral grounding, it would be sticking to this treaty that 123 countries have signed. Um, but I, I uh, also think that um, we have to recognize that um, while the US keeps crossing these lines, one of the excuses they're using is that Russia and Ukraine have both already used cluster munitions. 
And that is true. Uh, oftentimes, uh, administration officials will cite Russia using them and will fail to say that Ukraine has been using them as well. Uh, the uh, human rights groups have condemned both parties for using them. But this will lift it to another level in terms of the amounts that are being sent. They're talking about hundreds of thousands of these. So while it's never an excuse to be saying, well, my opponent is doing this, so I can too, um, we should also recognize that it takes it to new levels. And um, you know, we really should be thinking about what is the Ukrainian government contemplating in terms of the future? Because it will be Ukrainian citizens, Ukrainian children that will be killed by these bombs. So it's very, very short-sighted thinking. Absolutely. And uh, just to clarify, so these bombs that failed to explode and what there were millions that failed to explode, the tiny bombs uh, in Laos when the U.S. Uh, used cluster munitions there. These bombs, they, they litter the landscape of you know, several football fields. Civilians step on them. Uh, children might pick them up thinking they're toys only to have their limbs severed. This goes on and on. And, uh, and the cleanup operations drag on if they happen at all, right? Yes, and I have been in several areas where uh, cluster munitions were used and it could be many decades ago uh, like in the case of the, quote, demilitarized zone around North Korea um, that is still unusable for farming and dangerous for people. Or I was in southern Lebanon after the Israelis uh, just littered the whole area of southern Lebanon uh, with these cluster munitions. In fact, uh, that was one of the reasons that led to the, uh, to the ban. Um, and uh, farmers in that region are still uh, being hurt as children are being hurt from these. So whether we talk about Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, or we talk about other areas of the world, including Afghanistan, um, the the suffering goes on and on. Yes, and you know, on a on a hopeful note, uh, and some may disagree who are listening. On a hopeful note, this is one more wedge that divides NATO. Uh, people say, oh, NATO, I've heard this. People will say, oh, NATO is a defensive alliance. That's not true. Look at what NATO did. There's NATO has left a trail of blood in Afghanistan, Libya, Kosovo. Uh, it's hardly a defensive alliance, nor is it an alliance of those who support, who necessarily support democracy. Look at some of the outliers like uh, Turkey or Hungary and their leadership, Italy. So, uh, what is NATO other than uh, an arms cartel? I'm not really sure, but this is one wedge along with other wedges, you know, the, whether or not NATO will uh, admit Ukraine, there's lots of pushback on that, whether or not NATO will admit Sweden pushback from Turkey and Hungary on that. So uh, what do you think? What does it spell for the future of NATO? Well, I think there are all kinds of potential, as well as um, a present, divisions in NATO. Uh, certainly, the governments of the NATO countries and the media like to portray it as one happy family that's fighting the fight for global democracy. Uh, but internally, we see many divisions. We see uh, countries from Turkey, Greece, Hungary that don't abide by the sanctions against Russia. Uh, we see internally uh, uh, movements in places like Italy, uh, Czech Republic having a lot of uh, internal opposition to the um, uh, inflation that has been caused by this war. Uh, we see um, opposition internally in NATO countries to this push to keep sending, spending more and more money on militarism uh, as, as this has exploded with the Ukraine war. Uh, and so this is one more issue. You know, these 23 NATO countries that have signed the ban, it's not only that they're not supposed to use these weapons, it's that they're not supposed to cooperate uh, with the using of these weapons. And so this brings up an issue for them in how are they going to uh, deal with the transport and the use of these munitions that the U.S. is supplying so I think you're right, Marcy, this is one uh, more example of divisions within NATO. 
uh, which for us, I think, uh, in the, those of us who want to see a um, cooperative and peaceful world, um, we think these divisions are actually a good thing. Uh, the more that there is opposition within NATO to this very aggressive, dangerous alliance, um, the sooner we can move towards a world where uh, our alliances are for um, cooperating and not for killing each other. Yes, you know, uh, I can't uh, underscore that that statement vociferously enough. Not only, as, as we've discussed, are we looking at splits in NATO, but uh, I, I feel that regardless of whether this amendment by Omar and Jacobs to ban the use of cluster bombs, this amendment to the military budget, hits the floor regardless of whether it gets a vote or not, it is already starting to, uh, we see the wall crumbling around the White House in defense of this escalation in Ukraine. I, I think their moral high ground, if you wanna call it that, in justifying continuous weapons to throw gasoline on the fire and refusal to support a ceasefire, mass silence on the part of the Democrats and the Republicans, for a ceasefire. I, I think that this may be a turning point. I have to be hopeful uh, because it's very hard to say, yeah, we got to keep sending these cluster munitions to Ukraine to harm civilians decades from now. <laughs> well, you're right, Marcy. I think the fact that public opinion shows more and more Americans wanting to see an end to this war and questioning the over $110 billion we've spent so far uh, the elections coming up, the candidates, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, or Greens who have come out and made this an issue already uh, in their talking points, uh, and the fact that the CIA director, William Burns, recently went to uh, Kiev to talk to Zelensky about how are we going to end this war. And lastly, Marcy, the fact that it's been revealed that there have been what they call track two talks, which means informal talks, not official, among uh, uh, high ranking or former uh, US and Russian officials about how to move towards negotiations. And in one of those meetings, um, the Foreign Secretary Lavrov of, of Russia himself was uh, a part of it. Those are hopeful signs. And that's why it's so important that people join us in Peace in Ukraine at Code Pink uh, in building up this groundswell because uh, the more our uh, representatives hear from us, the American people, the more likely they're going to be pushing for a solution. Absolutely. So at this juncture, let me just invite everybody to visit our website at peaceinukraine.org. Of course, visit us at codepink.org as well. Uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, that wasn't the beginning of the war. We know a civil war led up to this. But following that invasion, Code Pink launched the Peace in Ukraine Coalition, and now we are working with over 100 organizations, Massachusetts Peace Action, Veterans for Peace, Roots Action, World Beyond War, uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, on and on, uh, to say, stop the fighting, stop the flow of weapons. It's not going to reach, uh, uh, it's not going to help us, right? It's only going to escalate this war. We need a ceasefire without any preconditions. You hear people say, oh yeah, I'm for peace, uh, Russian troops out of every uh, square mile of Ukraine. And you know, that's not, uh, that's not a negotiation. That's a maximalist demand. OK, you can make that demand. You make it at the negotiating table, but you at least start talking. Right. So uh, that's what we're talking about at the Peace in Ukraine Coalition. Check it out. Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink. Thank you so much for joining us on Code Pink Radio today. Terrific to have you with us. Great talking to you, Marcy. Bye bye. Bye bye.